And so please welcome our next panel, 40 Chances with Prime Minister Tony Blair uh, coming. Prime Minister. And they're here. And Howard Buffett, Ritu Sharma, and Betty Liu. Prime Minister Blair, uh, what an honor it is to have you at the World Food Prize. And to uh, and I think uh, today we've set a new record of filling this room. We've never had this many people packed in here before. So you've, you've outdone uh, Bill Gates and the, uh, Kofi Annan in coming here. So it's a new, a new record setting all week. Uh, having, uh, having you here and following on to all those other distinguished visitors, but I want to thank you especially for bringing Howard Buffett back to the World Food Prize. It's the toughest guy to get to come in October because he's he, he and his son, Howard W., they're always out on the farm, and I call him and say, can you come, Howard? And he'd say, I'm harvesting, I can't, I can't. Finally, I got him to come. He said, look, I'm going to fly in, I'm landing, I'm coming, I'm speaking, I'm leaving. I said, okay, it's all right. And, that, and then he came, and uh, he met so many interesting people here. He was here for six hours, and he's been back three times. So, Howard. Every, every time I come back, I get in trouble. That's right, <laughs> yes. That's what we love about you. So thank you so very much. Our great friend, Ridu Sharma, is here. What a terrific op-ed you have in the register today. Everybody buy the Des Moines Register. And, and with that, I just want to say our symposium is about the next Borlaug dialogue, uh, next Borlaug century biotechnology, sustainability, climate volatility, but the underlying big question is, the single greatest challenge in the history of the human race is whether we can sustainably feed nine billion people by the year 2050. That's what we're about, that's what Norman Borlaug was about, and that's what 40 Chances is about. So, Betty Liu, thank you, and I'm just gonna go down this way, and if I don't stumble and fall, be out of your way. Over thank to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to, uh, to the World Food Prize for uh, asking me and allowing me to host this panel. I'm so happy uh, and, uh, and, and eager and excited to be listening to all the comments that Prime Minister Blair, Ritu Sharma, and Howard Buffett are going to be talking about uh, in their work with food insecurity, global food insecurity. Uh, Howard, in your book, 40 Chances, one of the, one of the most interesting aspects of that book uh, was that much of your work has been a result of happy accidents, and maybe some not so happy accidents as well. And, that's my whole life, Betty. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> and you have met these two that are sitting beside you through some accidents. So why don't you describe first how you met Tony Blair and, and the accident that brought you two together on your work? Well, actually, uh, Tony has a very tenacious staff. And uh, one of them was e emailing me constantly, and I was like, well, what do Tony Blair and I have in common? You know, what are we going to, you know, do together? And so uh, then I got on an airplane. Uh, I'll put a plug in. It was actually a NetJet airplane. And uh, I read this magazine that had this really a phenomenal um, story about Tony. And I thought, I've really kind of made a mistake here. I should have met this man a long time ago. So we met in London at his home, uh, and he's been back to Decatur several times. Um, and it's just, it's been a great partnership because what we've learned over the last um, really two decades um, in our foundation and, and, and prior to that even as, as I was in business is that if, if you don't have good governance, um, if you don't have rule of law, if, if businesses don't know what to expect, if they don't have predictability, how can they invest? And so, you know, there's no one on the world stage that can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tony uh, and talk about this issue because of his history, his experience, uh, and his wisdom on the subject. So um, it's been one of our best partnerships that we've developed. Um, Ritu and I just ended up uh, meeting each other on a panel that, uh, that uh, DuPont had put on and in Washington. And, 
you know, we, we kept getting surprised because we kept agreeing on things. And so it was like, uh, wow, okay. And then, you know, she is, her organization and, and all the effort on her, on her part is doing something that the world talks about a lot, which is empowerment of women. But empowering women is not that simple. And, you know, it's one of the greatest things that can occur in any country. But look at our history. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty young at what we've done, and we still have a long ways to go in this country. So, you know, if you can think about a country like Burundi where in the culture it's completely accepted to basically abuse women, and they have no rights. I mean, think of what it takes to come from there to even get to where we are today. And so somebody has to be doing that work. And, and really, Redo's organization is, is uh, really unique in how they approach it and, and get it done. Well, I want to get to that in a moment. But first, Prime Minister Blair, tell me a bit about how you came up with your initiative, with the Africa Global, uh, Global Initiative, where you, it's about five years old now, where you said this really came up from an idea. Where did this idea come from, and why pursue it? It came partly from, from my own experience in, in, in government, um, and it came partly through my own experience in, in trying to work with and, and help Africa. So in 2005, in the G8 summit, we put Africa at the top of the agenda, really for the first time a G8 had ever done that. And um, we agreed a whole series of commitments on aid, um, which at least you know, our government and actually successive UK governments have delivered on, but we also agreed that we needed a new approach, a partnership, where the responsibility wasn't just on the developed world, but, but African countries were going to take on the job of sorting their own issues out. And, and governance was absolutely central to that. So I could see that happening in Africa. My own experience in government was really understanding that you know, I used to think when I first came into government um, that if I, I was prime minister and I had an idea sitting in Downing Street, um, that if I gave an order to someone to do something, you know, something would happen. Uh, <laughs> and this... Tony, I tried that at home. Or, 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 you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, this, this extraordinary naivety um, was replaced over time with the understanding that actually one of the biggest challenges of government today even in our systems, uh, by the way, if you don't mind me saying so a little. Um, um, anyway, we won't go there. Uh, uh, but, okay. right, but for, the, for these countries that sometimes are emerging after periods of conflict, you know, with huge problems, of course, one challenge of the government is honesty and transparency, but the other is efficacy. It's getting things done. And so, for example, if you've got a great um, agricultural program, and you want to deliver it, unless you've got the basic capacity at the center of government to make the thing happen, it doesn't happen. So this is what we, we focus on, and what we do is we put teams of people who go and live and work in the country, working alongside the president or prime minister of the country to help deliver um, programs of change. And we're in, actually by the end of this year, we'll probably be in about 10 different countries in Africa. And you know, it's, for me, it's all about getting the job done, because that's the single biggest challenge. And, and the great thing about Howard's organization has been being able to support us in doing that. Um, and the reason why the, the, the things we're talking about at the World Food Prize are so important is that you, know, you only have to spend a short time with the presidents of these countries to realize that they basically have three major challenges. One is around electricity and power and infrastructure on that. Um, and related infrastructure and roads and so on. Uh, the second is around getting the right type of investment, not the wrong type of investment into their country. But the third thing is being able to deliver improvements in agricultural output because the vast bulk of their population will be dependent on that. So the types of things you're talking about here are absolutely central, but you guys can have great ideas and we can try and implement them, but unless there's capacity to do that at the center of government, nothing happens. Well, Ritu, let's talk a little bit about your work because as Howard said, uh, and as you have said yourself, you want to empower women, but you can't just target women only because that will hold them back as well. You have to also bring men into the same cause. 
Absolutely, no question. And um, let me just first say I'm really honored to be sharing this panel with Prime Minister Blair and, and Howard Buffett. And I want to thank them for including the perspective of, of women. So very much appreciate that. And I mean, the truth is that women tend to like men. And, <laughs> and we, we don't despise them. And it, it, this I mean. <laughs> This is a new revelation. This is like, uh, forget the yeah. book. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> We're really with you so far. <laughs> okay. But the point is, is that when I talk to women around the world, when I sit in villages and talk to women farmers, they don't want us to only target them. They don't want us to just bring the interventions or the microcredit or the tools or finance or whatever it might be just to them because their husbands are struggling to grow food as well. Their husbands are unemployed. Their husbands are disenfranchised. And we're not really solving the problem if we just focus on women. I mean, women who go home to men who are unemployed, frustrated and have guns is not helpful. That does more harm to women um, than good. So I think it's, again, it's, it's intuitive, but it's something that in our zeal to, to help women and climb on this women's empowerment train, um, we can forget that we need to take a very holistic approach um, and that needs to in fact include everybody. And that's something, Howard, that you have seen yourself in your travels, not just in Africa, but other parts of the world. Well, you know, there's the poster child for, I always offend someone when I'm here, um, the poster child for violence against women would be a country like Burundi, where it's ingrained in their culture, and it's okay to abuse women. I mean, it's, it's expected. And, you know, to overcome something like that, you can't just you know, swoop in and say, you guys can't do this anymore, here's why, and here's what you gotta do. It'll never work that way. Um, so, you know, CARE, uh, when I was visiting Bruni once with them, they, they had this great program where they did these skits. And, and the men in, in the village would act out, and they would have other men who would tell them it was wrong to behave this way. And so it was, it was, it was, it was kind of making it okay to talk about it. It was kind of making it okay to understand what the alternative was. And of course, I jumped right in and took one of the guy's hats and became one of the drunken guys that was going to beat up his wife. And you know, and and uh, so they ran me out. And um, so, but you know, it, it, you have to find creative ways to do this. And uh, it was actually a very engaging way. And it was, a, it was you could see that that it was an opportunity for. To, to men to think about. When we were in Afghanistan, we had uh, worked on a program that brought, um, gave women the opportunity to farm their own land. And when we went, I said, well, of course I want to I speak to the women, but I actually want to speak to the husbands and, and get their perspective on it. And so, you know, the husband that we did speak to, because some of them didn't want to talk to us, but the one we did speak to, he said, you know, for the first time, I actually kind of appreciate my wife. And I said, well, why? Um, and he said, well, she's bringing home money. And, and that helps pay for things in the, in the household. And um, I never understood she could do that. So some things are a lot more simpler than we think they are. We try to make them complicated. This is real simple. If you have a mindset that doesn't understand the value of something, you don't appreciate it and you don't allow it to flourish the way that it can. And so, you know, everywhere you go in the world, um, we need to make sure that policies, our programs, our actions, the consequences of our actions uh, support equal opportunity for men and women. And, and that will change the world. Prime Minister, when, when you've gone on uh, and worked in the, in, the, in the various countries that you have, the 10, the 10 countries that you are now working with, what's been the most surprising? Because you mentioned capacity. I mean, you need to see governments having the capacity to execute uh, the ideas, to execute the policies, the, the ideas that they want to implement in their countries. But what has been the most surprising thing about that capacity or lack of capacity in these countries that you found? Um, the most um, surprising thing is 
how little political leaders are qualified and educated about what could be out there to help them. Now, again, this is not actually something that's uh, <laughs> simply a problem for African leaders. I mean, I, one of the things I find most shocking about my own time after leaving office is, is how much I've learned and therefore how much I didn't know when I was there, which is a bit unfortunate, but there it is. Um, uh, and one of the things that you, 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 you don't often understand is that there's so much innovation happening in the world today and there is so much new thinking that, you know, you're sitting in government, you've got a thousand different things happening and there are events happening and, you know, if you've got a free media, you're trying to battle with that too. Um, so you live in this, in this situation where what you really need to do is to take a step back, to be strategic, to prioritize, and then, as I say, to implement. But actually, that's not what a lot of governments do. What they do is they basically, they exist on a day-to-day -day basis, coping with what they can. Right, so the thing, you see, for example, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to, to, to come to this, this conference and say to people, one great change, however, that's happening is that there is a new generation of leaders in Africa, actually elsewhere in the world, who want to learn. You know, so there is a, a willingness, which I think is quite different. I, I don't think we could be doing what we're doing 20 years ago. I just don't think the the ambition would be there and, and the, the openness of mind would be there. But today, in the work that we're doing in these countries, in an area like agriculture, you know, I'm finding the presidents are saying to me, okay, tell me what's happening in the world today that can make a difference. So, you know, one of the things that w when I was coming here and I read about um, Norman Borlaug and his extraordinary life story, but this is someone who changed the world. But, you know, what's fascinating when you read about how he did it is it didn't, he had a great idea and everyone said that's fantastic and they went off and did it. I mean, he struggled for decades, right? But there, were, there was a, a, a new thinking that in the end people access. Now, I think the difference between his time and now is that I think people are prepared to access that type of new thinking faster. So, you know, what I would say is that where there are people with the ideas on things like you know, crop intensification, irrigation, how, how do you improve the, the yield of the land? How do you make more effective farming practices? You know, there's a willingness in these governments to listen today. So the most, the most surprising thing has been, you know, the lack of knowledge about what's out there. The most optimistic thing is that I think there is a new spirit and attitude out there that says, okay, if you've got something to teach me, I'm willing to listen. Are their goals big enough though? Are the ideas and the goals big enough when you go into these countries? Well, I think sometimes we make goals that are too big. I mean, I think, you know, you can set all the goals you want in the world, and it does, to me it doesn't mean very much because um, usually we fail at those goals, and then we have to go back and reset. And so I think sometimes we set goals that, are, that, are, that, that expect too much of either a system or people or circumstances or environments or whatever it is. So you know, we like to be pretty focused at our foundation. And, and we think that if we are focused, um, it allows us to set higher goals because we, we can really zero in on them. But I think we really need to uh, understand that, that we aren't going to solve all these problems. We aren't going to solve them quickly. Anybody who understands agriculture, I mean, I, you know, if you take my farm that's 15 miles away, I farm it differently. If you take the farm we have in Arizona, I farm it differently. If you take Howie's farm in Nebraska, we farm it differently. I mean, there are things we do that are completely the same and things that we have to do differently. You know, I mean, when you look at Africa, you have all these different agricultural growing zones. You have 54 countries, okay? Uh, no one treats Canada and the United States the same. Why would you treat Malawi and Nigeria the same? Other than Akina's in Nigeria, that's special. But, um, but, but you know, it, it's just that you, you have to understand the context. And so, you know, we have, to set, we have to set those goals within that context. Has that made you then want to focus on certain countries then? You say, you know what, you can't help all of, all of the countries. There are only, there are only a few well, that's one approach. Or only aspects I think that's that one approach. Help. I think that's where AGI has been really, really smart because they go into countries where the government accepts them and wants them. How can you go into a country that doesn't really want your advice? 
you know, I mean, my dad used to always say to me, he said, he says, now don't come and ask my advice unless you're going to take it. You know, I mean, it was like, you know, and, and, and I learned that lesson early on. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't take enough of it, um, but you know. So you know, there there is there is uh, that is one approach. I mean, one approach is to say, you know, we try to stay very focused in three areas: um, agriculture, water, and conflict mitigation. Uh, that's actually almost too much, to be honest with you. And and uh, but but they all overlap. So where we work, they they typically all overlap. But you know, I just think setting realistic goals and then trying to achieve those and then move to the next one. And you're always going to have setbacks. You're going to have surprises. You're going to have things you don't expect. Um, so you can't say this is where I'm going to be, you know, at this specific time in place. It, it just doesn't work that way. Well, Ritu, what, what have been some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen uh, policymakers, nonprofit organizations do in Africa? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the top. I think and it, to, to continue with Prime Minister Blair's idea about where are the best ideas? Where is the innovation? Where is the energy? And I think one thing we tend to overlook is how much of that innovation and energy is with smallholder farmers themselves. You know, yes, it's in inter international in institutes for seed research. Yes, it's in uh, universities. But that what farmers are doing and trying with their own land is also extraordinary. Um, women farmers, even if they have just one hectare, they are interested in experimenting. They are interested in trying new things. And I, I think one of the most important things where we engage on agriculture is really to say that, you know, women want choices and they want to understand what all of their choices are for all of the agricultural methods that we might be bringing to them, not just one choice. And they want to be able to have the power to decide for themselves what method they're going to use on what part of their farm. Because women's land, I think if you're familiar with women, particularly in Africa, you know, they don't necessarily have one block piece of land. They've got little bits and pieces over here and they're all different and they all need different things. So I think one mistake that we tend to make in our development field in general is to think that the people that we are serving are passive recipients of knowledge, of information. They're not. You know, they're more engaged with their farms than anybody. And, and we need to look for the innovation, for the insight, you know, for the brilliance that's, that's within those farmers, particularly women. I think you know, male farmers, yeah, sometimes guys think other guys are pretty smart. But, you know, women are, there's, there's a lot of innovation there, too. Prime Minister, have you ever encountered resentment in your work? Uh, resentment, generally, yes. <laughs> 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 a fair amount of it, but um, uh, in, respect, <laughs> in respect of AGI, um, uh, yes, because sometimes there's always a... Um, there's always a feeling that, that, you know, people from the outside shouldn't tell us what to do type of thing. On the other hand, there's also great examples that you can give people now of countries that, you know, I sometimes give the example of, of, of Singapore. Once it was thrown out of, of the Malaysian Federation, it started as an independent state. Um, you know, for, for the first two decades, it was importing intellectual capital. Right? Today it exports it. Right? But it did it because... The, the leadership of the time decided, we just want to know what works. And, and so, yes, you, you, you do get resentment sometimes, but on the whole, not, I would say. And, you know, the thing is that, that has changed and that allows us to do our work um, is the fact that, you, you know, people are, are anxious and eager for it. And the, the other thing is, because this is a very obvious thing for the world today, you know, the world is connected. Africans are actually connected. I mean, the explosion in mobile phones in Africa and actually their use um, in, in helping empower people is extraordinary. And the fascinating thing, you see, this is what I think is, is so important for people who are in positions of government today. The fascinating thing is there is a huge um, amount of, of information and ideas that are out there that you can use. And I mean, I think... Um, it's absolutely right. You know, you've got to interact with the local people in order to work out how those ideas are most beneficial. 
But the fact is, probably someone somewhere in the world is getting it right. And, and you know, one of the things that I often find with countries is they'll say to me, um, you know, but our problems are very different from... And then you get into a proper discussion, you realise, well, yep, they've got their own local characteristics, but actually the basic processes are exactly the same. And, I mean, I think that, that, that one of the things that, that we find we can do now, because there is this, this sense that there's a, um, a, a global... Um, you know, a global dimension to information, we can actually take great ideas to governments. And one of the things we find with some of our presidents now, and this is something I'm actively doing in a number of areas, and I'd be really interested to do it in agriculture, is we say to them, and this is uh, somewhat to Howard's point earlier, look, I don't know whether this can help or not, but why not try it in a limited way and let's see what we can learn from it. So instead of thinking, you know, we're going to change the whole of agricultural production, let's take a certain part of the country where people are interested in it and try and experiment. And, you know, we're doing this in things like education and healthcare, um, in things like renewable energy, where, where you know, small-scale projects. So this is what's exciting about this, this area of, of work today, and it's why I think if we could join up the ideas there with the people out in those countries desperate to learn about them. I think we get some, some fabulous and, and really exciting well, things happening. Where do, where do you think you've had the best success and why? Um, we've always had the best success in countries. Actually, it takes us probably two or three years to get really going. Um, so the countries we've been in longest, um, countries like uh, Rwanda and Sierra Leone, Liberia, um, but also elsewhere where we have prioritized. You know, one of the toughest things about government is this process of prioritization. Um, because you can never say anything's not important if you're a politician, right? <laughs> I mean, you can't say, so you sort of say, I remember when I first came into to power and I had this thing, my top three priorities are education, education, and education. Right, which I was really pleased with as a soundbite. And <laughs> so I go out and someone says, so you don't care about crime? And I said, no, 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 I care about crime, but it's just, I, I, you know, <laughs> anyway, so it, it doesn't really work. And often you will go to a country and they'll have had some report written by fly-in, fly-out consultants that will say, you know, poverty reduction strategy, 2030. Or I came across one that was 2060 the other day, which is, you know, that's pretty, uh, <laughs> you're hedging your bets pretty well there. So, uh, <laughs> um, but, um, and they will often have 150 different priorities. Mm. And what I say to the presidents or prime ministers is, look, forget that, choose five. Because in one term, if you're lucky, you'll get those done. But you can get them done if you prioritize. But if you try and do the whole thing, you know, it'll just be the usual mess. How about you, Howard? Where, do you where have you found your foundation to be most effective and why? Well, I, I would answer that this way, which is it all comes down to people. Um, we think about investing in people, not in organizations, not in ideas. Um, there's a guy in Virunga National Park, uh, Emmanuel, who is the head of the park. We're, we're investing millions of dollars in North Kivu this year and next year, I mean tens of millions because he's there and we believe in him and we have trust in him and he trusts us and we've done some phenomenal things there and they may or may not work but we're willing to try him because of him there's a guy joe defreeze uh, who ought to be here today he may not be but uh who's uh supported a lot you know he came out of the rockefeller foundation supported a lot by the gates foundation and we support him uh quite a bit uh this guy is in, in my opinion if you want to look at agriculture he's a modern day hero I mean, you know, we invest in, in people that, that are passionate, that believe, that are focused, um, that, because that's how we're going to change something. Um, and, and there's a, a guy, Ed Price, and Dr. Price may be here. You know, I met him in Afghanistan when we had flak vests on getting in a Black Hawk helicopter. And I said, well, is this your first time here? He says, no, I've been here 18 times. I said, you know, I mean, okay, I'm a novice. But, you know, the, you, know you just need people who are willing to go out. I've never learned anything well, I better be careful. I was going to say I've never learned anything by reading a book, but that's not quite true. But, uh, but, but, but you know, I, I mean, what I, where I really learn things is in the field. I mean, people 
when I'm sitting with a farmer in Malawi, he's going to teach me something that I couldn't learn in any book, okay, in any lecture. Um, I, I just, you know, it's, it's, it, you've got to be there. You've got to do it. And um, so we keep showing up. And, and that's most of the battle is showing up and talking to the people. That, they're the ones that suffer the consequences from your good decision or your bad decision. And, and Joe tells a great story in the book about, you know, how he thought he was really helping people in a village and he found out that the hybrid he had brought had failed. There were a lot of people hungry because of him. He never forgot that, and he decided, I'm not making that kind of mistake again. So you, you have to make the mistakes, and you have to learn from them. But we really invest in people, and, and I believe in people. I believe in Tony, and I believe in Ritu, and, and we, we, you know, we believe in a lot of people. There's, there's phenomenal people out there that are doing great things. Well, speaking about your book, I mean, I don't know if, if everyone knows what 40 chances uh, means exactly. I mean, and I'm just going to paraphrase it. You correct me if I'm wrong, but... You know, essentially, you're saying that everybody has 40, 40 years, 40 chances, right, to make a difference in this world. And you learned that through farming. Yeah, well, I went to this thing called planter school, which I'm sure everybody here would, you know, want to go to. Uh, and I kind of forced myself to go. It's in the wintertime. You don't have anything better to do. And uh, there are about 40, 50 of us sitting in this room, and there's a speaker. And I actually thought it was maybe quite boring. Um, and he started out by saying, you know, all you guys are wrong about how you think about you're farming. And I thought, well, that's a pretty bold statement. And he said, you know, by the time you're, uh, you know, you think about it like, you know, I'm going to fertilize, I'm going to plant, I'm going to spray, I'm going to harvest, I'm going to, you know, it's just, it's just a cycle that goes on and on. And you really need to stop and back up and realize that by the time your, you know, your dad gets off the tractor and let's, you know, you get on the tractor, you know, uh, and then you get off, let your son or daughter get on, you've got about 40 seasons to grow the best crop you can. I, it actually made me stop and think about some of the things I was doing in agriculture, to be honest with you, and changed a few things I thought about and how I did my personal farming. But I thought about that and I thought, well, you know, that's really true in life. Um, you get through school, um, you get a little bit of experience, uh, and at some point you're ready to try to tackle something big. You've got about 40 years to do that. Now, Senator Harkin has had about 60, but, you know, or 70, but, you know, and, and he looks like he's 40. I better say that, right? Uh, and, and, and Governor Brandstad the same. So, you know, there, there are, you know, but it, it is a mindset as much as anything that, you know, there's an urgency to what we have to do. This doesn't go on forever. We don't get unlimited opportunities. Um, so let's focus on what we can change and try to change it. We're all in the middle of our 40 chances then, if we were to, to use your, to use your um, uh, analogy, then what would you say? This is a room full of people who can make a difference on the issue of, of food insecurity around the world. What would you say to this room full of people? What should they take away to improve the welfare of people, not just in Africa, but around the world, around food? Well, the first thing is, is um, you have to understand that what we know and our knowledge doesn't automatically transfer to other parts of the world and other people's problems. Because if you come in and you say, our solution is this, um, it'll almost for sure fail. Um, the second thing is, and I never, it took me a long time to learn this. I learned this through our water work, to be honest with you, um, is that policy matters. I mean, you've got to have the right policy. You can't get the right results if you don't have the right policies. Now, to Tony's point, it's a big deal when you say we're going to implement that. But, but you don't have a starting point. You know, it's like filling a car with gas. You're not going anywhere until you got it. So, I mean, you know, you've got to, you've got to have that. And then third, I think, you know, um, in a way, dream big, but don't think too big. I mean, you've, 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 you've got to be able to reach the goals. You have to set goals that other people you know, don't walk away and go, oh, I can never do that, or that's never going to happen. I mean, you've, you've got to be realistic. And I think sometimes we're not very realistic. And, um, and the last thing, really, honestly, is um, you really got to believe in people. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of people I've met, whether it's a, a, a woman in a refugee camp or a president that we work with on our counter-LRA activity. I mean, you know, uh, or the soldiers that are out in the jungle trying to track somebody down that, that, that is a bad guy. I mean, you know, they, the, the commitment, the, the, the willingness to make personal sacrifice, um, it, it's amazing. There are amazing people in this world, and you just got to find them, and you got to empower them. How about you, Ritu? Would you agree with that? 
Uh, absolutely. Um, I always agree with everything. <laughs> but, what, but what I will add to that is that, you know, poverty is ultimately when you, when you peel back all the layers, it's really about powerlessness, right? It's about the inability to change your environment, to change your practices. It, it's, it is, there's a barrier to your getting what you need in order to move out of poverty. And I think for the people in this room, the most important thing I would say is that in addition to your intervention, whatever intervention you are taking out there into the world, you have to address the relative powerlessness of those that you're trying to help. And women are the least powerful among the powerless. So what I mean by that, I can give you a very, very simple example. If you go into a community in Burkina Faso, let's say, where I've spent some time with subsistence farmers there, and you bring in your intervention methods, you bring in a new seed variety, you bring in fertilizers, you bring in some pesticides, and you, you train all these women up on how to use all of these techniques, right? But you don't address the fact that they don't have the power to own their own land. Right? They need to organize themselves, they need to go to the village elders, they may need to even change their national laws on ownership of property. But if those women don't own that land, they have no incentive to pay for all of those expensive inputs. Because as soon as they improve that land and they make it better and it actually starts to grow more things, a man's going to come and take it. Because now it's good land. So, Great, you got a better yield for one season and that'll show up on your metrics and the donor is really happy with that better yield. But what have you done for those women now that they're displaced from the good land, right? So it, that's just a very, and I've seen that happen again and again and again. So you have to look at what is underlying, um, what is underlying that poverty. What is, what are the power structures, what are the barriers that any farmer, male or female, is facing and address that at the same time um, if you really want to succeed. Well, it's a good point, Prime Minister, that, that Ritu's bringing up, which is uh, also the idea that how do you know that what you're implementing uh, is A, fitting into the broader context of, of the culture uh, of the country, but also that it's long term, that it will be there when you leave. Yeah, no, that, that, that is definitely the challenge. But on the other hand, I think you can, you can see very clearly when it starts to happen. And you know, what, what Ritu is saying about the empowerment of, of women is an essential part because you know, I can't think of a successful country today that, that has got an attitude from the past about, about women that, you know, it doesn't work. And so so you, you, you have a situation in which one of the things, you know, because one of the types of things we do with government is obviously say, well, how are you going to make your economy successful? Women, women's education, the ability to own property, to be treated in the right way, that is an essential part, not just of something that is socially and morally right, but that is economically essential for the development of the country. But does that fall on deaf ears sometimes? Um, increasingly less. So I think this is the, because people know, I mean, they can look around the world and see which countries are successful and which aren't. I mean, you, know, you take a country like South Korea, South Korea in, uh, um, in the early 60s had a GDP per head the same, as, um, the same as Liberia or Sierra Leone, right? Today it's got a, a, a woman president. Not a bad idea, by the way, but it's, uh, that's another matter. But it, it's, I, don't, I don't want to get into your, your stuff around this, but, but, um, but it, it's, it, 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 so I think things are, are, are changing. Um, and just finally to your point about people here, I mean, I'd like to say two yeah. very direct things. The first is that the work that you are doing is of fundamental importance to the development of the poorest countries in the world. They're dependent on agriculture. Um, they have huge agricultural potential and they need help and support. And if we do not deal with the issues to do with food production, we cannot feed the growing population of the world. We also can't deal with issues like water, 
which are increasingly going to dominate uh, geopolitics and possibly in a very negative way unless we resolve some of the issues to do with the relationship between agriculture and water. And the second thing is to say to you, those ideas that you have, um, there, there are people out there willing to listen and to learn and to take your support and your help and advice. So, you know, you're not, you're not having to beat the door down anymore. The door is open. So what I would say, because I know there'll be many people engaged in, in very exciting, innovative things here. Um, you know, we need your help. We want your help. And those countries that we're working in, that Howard is working in, and, and Riva too, I mean, the, these, are, are, these are nations and people that can see how they can be connected today, and they want that connection, and you can help them. Uh, in just the time that I have left, I want to talk a little bit um, about, about developed countries and how the West can help in this and, and, for, and the, the issue of foreign aid. How do you get, and you know, we talked about this as well backstage, how do you get countries like the United States, how do you get countries in Europe to care about food insecurity, to care about bringing up countries in Africa? How do you get them to care? You're looking at me. Buddy. <laughs> um, well, I think, yeah, I Tony think will pass on that one. Yeah. Like this in Decatur of all places. Yeah. No, you know, that's always a relevant question, and it'll never change, unfortunately, because people care about what's in front of them. They care about whether their kids are eating, their kids are getting to school, uh, whether their government's functioning, whether, you know, I mean, they, they care about that. And, and so you're, that's, that is always going to be their priorities. Local priorities are always going to be the priority. So I think, you know, you have to appeal to uh, a little bigger thinking on it. And, and a lot of people, you know, I, I mean, America, this country is one of the most generous countries in the world. Um, now, that happened because of our tax system, but uh, it happens because we are wealthy enough that we can afford to do it. I mean, it happens for a lot of reasons that aren't all completely altruistic. But uh, nevertheless, I think as you, as you begin to see that those behaviors have positive consequences, then you're more willing to do it and you're more willing to do more. So I, I think part of it is, you know, we, we've been in countries, we're very, I mean, I have permanent residency in South Africa. We're very involved in South Africa. They don't have the same, it's changing though. It really is changing. But 10, 10 15 years ago, there was not so much the notion of philanthropy or giving or, or helping. It is really changing and that's a great thing. But, you know, those are places where we can share our experiences that are positive to help move that along. But they have to believe that it's the right thing to do or they're not going to do it. So, you know, a lot of it is, is education, awareness. Um, the greatest thing in the world is, and it's hard to do this on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but the greatest thing in the world is take somebody somewhere. You know, take them to Malawi, take them to Nigeria, take them to, to Bangladesh, take them somewhere, uh, Afghanistan. Show them what the world's about. I mean, I started taking Howie when he was 12 years old. And, uh, you know, that was the first trip we made to Africa. And, and uh, you know, I, I guarantee you it's changed his thinking. It's changed his vision of what the world could look like or what it should look like. So I, I think we shortchange ourselves in terms of just looking at our own little world. Uh, it's bigger than that. And, and I guess I would just add that, that we're learning that it's bigger than that. You know, I mean, um, whether it's terrorism or, or something else that can hit to home, uh, we're kind of learning, you know, uh, we're not, and we're not, and the United States is learning, we're not the only guys on the block anymore. The Cold War is gone, we're in a different era, and uh, even if the United States and Russia got together and decided something, it might not happen. So, I mean, you know, it's, you've, got, you've got big emerging powers. So the world is changing, and I, and I do think most people understand that. Well, and you took, and you took the prime minister on your combine. Indicator, yeah, that was, right? That's probably one of the most dangerous things I've done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> forget, forget Somalia. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. And, and actually, the mistake I made was corn was worth about eight dollars when he was on the combine. Now it's worth about four dollars. So it, you know, I, next time he comes, I'm waiting for the price to drop, and then I'm going to invite him back and let him drive again. But <laughs> that's not a great advertisement for my governance initiative. <laughs> oh no, uh, it has nothing to do with that, Prime Minister. No, he, 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 you are, you are the absolute top in the world when it comes to what you do on your governance initiative. There's no question about that. But you do that too because, because you, you want people to see where food comes from, that it's not, as we talked about, 
packaged all nicely in a, in a, in a supermarket well, the, aisle. The primary thing is, you, you can say that about when Americans come out there, uh, you know, because they all think their food comes to the supermarket. But um, the, the, the biggest thing of value to me is to get, um, we had a few people come out from, from one uh, a couple years ago, and, you know, none of them have been on a farm before. And, you know, they're looking, they're in a $350,000 combine on, you know, $12,000 an acre land today. Um, the expense to operate, the access to capital, the access to inputs, all the things that it takes for us to farm this way. And I said, you really think you can farm this way with tens of millions of farmers in Africa? You can't. Now, if I, if I could make, the, the magic map for me, to be honest with you, and I don't know how you do this because the information isn't good enough to do it. The magic map for me is to take Africa and be able to, to draw the little places where our farming system works because it is productive. We can do it better. We can absolutely do it better. But um, it does work. It feeds a lot of people. It produces a lot, of, uh, a lot of crops. But then there's a whole lot of big circles where you need crop diversity, where you don't have affordability, accessibility, uh, knowledge. I mean, knowledge, knowledge is one of the biggest. You can throw money at a problem, but if people don't understand how to solve it, it doesn't matter how much you spend. You're not going to succeed. And knowledge is really missing. You know, if I, if I had another magic wand, I would say the, the first thing I would do, if I could do it magically, is I would put a land-grant university or something like it in every single country in Africa and establish a network. I mean, it, it built this country. It built this country, and it works. And basically, Brazil has done it a little differently, but they've done it in a similar way. And so, you know, we just have, we have to empower farmers to make good decisions. And we have to empower farmers to make decisions they can afford to make. And so, you know, that does come down to government policy in the end. I mean, we can give all the money away. We can, we can work with all the organizations in the world. But in the end, you know, I learned it the hard way. We can't change much. So, you know, it, it's, it's a big challenge. But as I always say, the alternative is to give up, and that's unacceptable. Well, tell me, take me back, because I am curious. Take me back, Prime Minister, when, you know, the time that you did visit Howard on his farm, and, and, and you taught, he not only taught you how to operate a combine, but... <laughs> but I think that would be to exaggerate the <laughs> well, level hey, of instruction. Listen, listen his, be, his biggest benefit was the fact that he could run most of the combine hands-free on the satellite system. So. <laughs> <laughs> but what did you come away with from that conversation or from your visits with Howard, and how did that shape, shape AGI? Well, I came away with a firm conviction that I'd made a wise career move in not becoming a farmer. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I mean, I, it, it helped focus me and, and my organization um, on, on the, the issues to do with agriculture. But I think it, it, it also... Um, it, it also educated me to, to another thing that I think is very important when we talk about how do we get our own political systems to focus on development. I mean, Howard's absolutely right. You know, people, you know, in my politics and your politics, they're going to think about the end of their own street first, and that's natural. However, the fact is, um, if you look at these countries in Africa and as they develop, it is massively in our interest, in our self-interest, that they develop in a, in a peaceful way, in a prosperous way, and with, with, with the populations there that are growing all the time with a decent stake in the, in the future. And the alternative, as we can see in some parts of Africa, is conflict, extremism, um, and obviously uh, poverty amongst the people. But one of the things that I took away from that first uh, encounter there with, with, with Howard was part of the problem with our government systems. I mean, a lot of the government aid has worked. I mean, it's important people realize that. There's been massive reductions in deaths from HIV AIDS and malaria, partly as a result of you know, the work of the Gates Foundation, Clinton Initiative, and so on, but also as a result of the funding by government. So aid does work. However, you know, if you want to take countries to the next stage of development, you need um, our governments in the support they give these countries to be far less bureaucratic, um, you know, far less interested in our priorities rather than their priorities, and far more willing to be creative about the solutions that we put forward. And this is where you know, Howard's organization, which operates you know, fast, effectively, 
um, with the urgency that these countries require is, is you know, these organizations are important in their own right. They're also a lesson for government, you know, because this, again, is something I, I learned in government. I mean, the great thing about government is that, you know, they can always give you a thousand reasons for not doing something, right? Uh, but, you know, find a reason for doing something is quite, is quite difficult. I know you probably never got the TV series, uh, yes, Prime Minister, I mean, did you ever get that? You, you, you got that? <laughs> right, you got that here? Right, so some people do, yeah. Anyway, it's really, it's not a comedy show, it's really a documentary about government. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, that's, if we wanted to make, if we wanted to make a, a, a difference, and there are, you know, you're the new leader of USAID, or Raj Shah is actually a great example of the new generation of leaders in this area, but we need to get our own governments to be smarter, quicker, and far more attuned to what the people in the country are saying, because by the way, they might just know better than you do what their priorities are. You know, Betty, when he mentions Raj, I think of one thing. Um, you can take, this is something we've learned the hard way, and Raj is phenomenal, and, 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 uh, but I know some of his stories, and you know, you can take a great person and put them in a terrible process. And unfortunately, most of the time, the process wins. And that's part of what we have going on in government. Uh, and, and, and I'm not just talking about what just happened here, but I just mean overall, is you have this process. And you know, the criticism of our foundation would be that we don't have as much process, but we do move quickly and we are willing to take risk. So you know, we just have to empower those people and, and somehow help them beat the process so that they can they can have success. So how do you do that? How, how, go ahead. Try to answer that, and also uh, on your question, Betty, about how do we get Americans to care? Because I think Americans really caring and understanding these issues is part of beating the process. I think it's part of getting to a place where America is where Britain was, where when you cut the budget, you don't cut aid. You know, and. This is a lot of what we do at Women Thrive, is trying to connect American women to women farmers overseas, to the stories of people. If you can't get them on a plane, the next best thing you can do is engage them in a conversation about what's happening with women around the world. And I think that one of the things that Americans are longing for is meaning. We have our SUVs, we have our nice houses, you know, we are only concerned with what's at the end of our street. But one of the things that we have lost in our lives is meaning. And this fight, this fight against poverty, this fight against hunger is a place where I think we can introduce meaning into people's lives again and get them excited about these issues. So um, I think our hope is that that's a role that we can play as we go out into the world and we connect women to other, to other women, it is, it is ultimately the power of citizens, I believe, to force a change with government. I think maybe we'll see that happening uh, with our own government in the years ahead, we can only hope. Uh, but, but it really is, does come down to people caring enough to demand that the systems and the processes change. Prime Minister, you must have some governance advice for us here. <laughs> Not really. Uh, <laughs> um, no, like it's. What do, you, what do you want me to say? <laughs> um, no, we Put just. Them off uh, the hook, yeah, yeah. I we, know. we Put them on look. The spot. We. I, I gather things are getting sorted out. No, but it's. It's. By the way, it is important for the world that that America gets some stability in its process back. So I mean, how you do it's up to you. But from the perspective of the international community, people want. America strong and focused and um, hopefully not, not going from one crisis to, 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 to the other because that's important for all of us because you're such an important part of the world and it's, it's interesting that... Well, you need a stable United States. That, that is an essential prerequisite of a stable world and, and even in these countries that we're talking about out in, in some of the more remote parts of the world, um, believe it or not, they're quite focused on hoping uh, that, that, that you guys find a way through these issues. All right, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I should have a medal for diplomacy on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I wanted to thank our panel today for a fantastic conversation to Prime Minister Blair, 
Ritu Sharma and Howard Buffett. Thank you.